Good morning, Yorks Classic Cars Limited fans, uh, and welcome to another bright, breezy, sunny, beautiful day in Retford. Cold, fresh, and glorious. Today, I would like to do you a little bit of a buyer's guide based on the Mark IV Stroke 1500 Triumph Spitfire, like the one behind me. Um, off we go. Uh, the Mount 4 Triumph Spitfire. <clears throat> this one was dropped off on Saturday. Um, I know the car. This is a very late Spitfire. Um, it's uh, in, finished in a silver, which is non-Triumph colour, uh, but I think it absolutely suits the car. Uh, most of the colours that were standard suited the car. The, the car's one of those shapes. It's got that Coke bottle shape. Um, if you look here, talk about the Coke bottle shape on Camaros and things. It's got a very similar sort of line. Obviously, it's not the same shaped car, but it's a similar sort of line. Um, and that's sort of reminiscent of the 70s. And that seems to fit, make it work with an awful lot of very nice, loud, uh, gregarious colours. Whereas more modern cars are a little bit duller and they don't, they don't have that shape. And they don't, you know, silver or grey or black seems to be what everybody chooses. But anyway, I digress. Um, why am I doing a buyer's guide on the Mark IV Spitfire? I've done one on the GT6. Um, this car is very, very similar to a Mark III GT6. There are a lot of similarities. However, um, these are one of the, the real classics of, the, of the, the century for me again. GT6, very nice sports car, very quick, um, but more expensive than a Spitfire. Your Spitfire is still available for very, very, very sensible money. Um, and, and I do mean there's not much else you can buy for the price of a, a, a decent Spitfire, a rough Spitfire needing a bit of work either if you do it yourself or pay someone to do it is still available very very cheap indeed um and we're not in the days of being able to walk out and buy a 300 pound car anymore that doesn't happen but you can still buy one of these rough for probably a couple of thousand so that's pretty good compared to something like for example the mini which you know you're gonna be looking at five or six thousand even for a, for a dog you know so yeah to break it down this is why i like the spitfires this is what you need to look for um and this is this is sort of how to identify the different ones in the thirty in the sorry, the Mark IV, which was a thirteen hundred engine, and the fifteen hundred, which was obviously a fifteen hundred engine, which is what this one is. Um, to look at the the Mark IV and the fifteen hundred, they're incredibly similar. Okay, um, they do differ. Some of them have black trims here. Okay, some have chrome trims, and I believe the Mark IV had chrome trims. Always, but I could be totally wrong. Um, so they, they get changed over the years, and it really, really doesn't matter. I prefer them with the black trims, but the chrome trims do look nice too, so I've got no objection to that. You'll see here also that the, uh, the trims around the rear lamps are black on this car too. Um, chrome, like the bumpers, the bonnet, um, the front corners, these parts, they're all just the same on a Mark IV or a 1500. But obviously different to a Mark III. Uh, the windscreen, that is the same on all the cars, um, on all Triumph Spitfires, TR6s, TR4s, just about every car fitted the same windscreen at Triumph. They must have bought them cheap from Pilkington's, one can only assume. Okay. So I'm going to lead off uh, number one point when looking at buying a Spitfire. Um, it doesn't really matter what the price is. I, I've said this in many videos before, and I will say it again in this video, um, it depends kind of what you're expecting. If you're wanting a perfect show car, you're gonna have to pay a premium for it, or you're gonna have to buy one and have it restored. If you're having a car restored, and you, you, you're wanting it to be absolutely millimeter perfect show car, showstopper that you basically can't use because it's that immaculate and perfect, then you're probably gonna try and find one that's had the minimal amount of work done in the past. But that goes for all classics, not just Spitfires. Um, Bodywork on Spitfires, very similar to the GT6. So, everywhere suffers. There is no part of a car from the 70s that won't suffer with rot. 
The only really massively expensive part to change on a Spitfire is the bonnet. You can see this one here. Uh, and I did mention on the GT6 video, these are available absolutely brand new. Um, when the chap bought the new one for the GT6, which obviously has the bulge in the middle, but does fit the same and is the same in every other way, um, I, I believe it was about 16 or 1700 pounds, including VAT, and he had to pick it up himself, which meant renting a van and blah, blah, blah. Um, now then, that was probably three or four years ago, so uh, inevitably they will be significantly more expensive than that. Now, you can buy the panels to repair a bonnet. So, for example, if we look at the bonnet this customer has supplied with this one, this is actually a very good bonnet. It, it looks a little bit knocked about, but it is actually a really good bonnet. You know, all these sections are available, okay? Uh, they do come to quite a high price if you do buy them separately. And, of course, if you're getting somebody to weld them in for you, the time-consuming aspect of that, removing the old panels, dressing the panels, uh, and welding in the new panels, will be quite expensive. I'm going to have this one either soda blasted or acid dipped and hopefully it'll all come back absolutely lovely with minimal repair work considered, um, uh, required rather. Um, but you, I won't know until all the filler and paint is off it. It looks pretty good to my naked eye, but that, that said, you know, I'm not infallible. Right, so going on, bodywork, doors. You need good doors. If you're going to have a car restored, you do need good doors. They are something you need straight. There are two types of door. Uh, GT6 doors are different. They have a quarter light here. Spitfires don't have that. Um, these doors and um, the import or export doors, so American doors, they have a reinforcing bar across the middle here. Um, it makes them significantly heavier. Uh, but other than that, it's just a side impact bar. Other than that, you, they don't look any different. So if, if you have to use import doors, that's all it is. Uh, skins and things are available. Not an easy job to skin a door, but they are absolutely available. Uh, Fit-wise, I did say this on the GT6 as well. There should be a gap at the back here. Um, that's a good gap, okay? It's, uh, it's not quite perfectly parallel, but it's pretty good. At the front here... On here, adjacent to the bonnet and down the edge of the sill, it should be about 10 to 15 mil, well, 12 to 15 millimeters there. So this car's had sills on it sometime. I can see that just by looking at it. And it means they're a little tiny, teeny bit further back than they should be. Uh, or potentially the sills are spot on, the door is close together and the wing has been changed and it's just slightly too far forward. All these things are fixable. Um, Again, if you wanted a perfect show concourse winning car, you'd worry about that. But for a car that you can use, as long as the doors open and close, which they do, obviously, then that's fine. Um, you know, the gap should be there. That gap is absolutely fine. These cars are quite flexible, so it's not a big deal. Um, rear wings, same as the GT6, except it doesn't have the aperture here um, for the fuel cap. They do rot in the bottom corner here. This is what this car's come in for, not this side. This side is fine. The other side has a little hole in it. I'll show you that. There, you should be able to see that here. Um, it's a little more involved of the job than it looks. You don't just whop a piece on the outside. There's a piece that goes up at the back that ties into the boot floor, which is also often quite rotten because dirt and moisture collects in there from the boot. Uh, and that's what rusts it from the inside out generally. Uh, if it's rusted from the outside in because of chips and salt and all that sort of stuff, excuse me, that's obviously good news. Um, but it may, it may not. Who knows? Again, this side, good dog gap there. So there is a dog gap, which is, is you know, a good thing. Uh, sills to do on a Spitfire or GT6 are um, quite a difficult job. Getting them correct, you do have to reinforce and rebuild all this section here first. Um, and then there is a set method of doing it to make sure you retain all your door gaps and your floor alignment and everything. And I'm not about to tell you how to do that. I had to learn how to do it. If you want to do it, you learn how to do it. It's not an easy job and I'm not giving the game away on that for anybody who might be watching. Wings, quite easy to change. Okay, rear wings. <clears throat> if I open this door here, there should be a seam here. They're usually filled over, but I wouldn't worry about that too much if they are. And then this seam here is where the wing attaches here. Well, hopefully you can see that if I'm pointing in the right direction. So this seam here is where the wing attaches. 
it welds across here under that chrome trim and then there's a spot welded seam externally on the, on the top of the wing there it's quite easy um, and then that continues down the rear of the car and again there's a spot welded seam this is all part of that wing and the bumpered bolts through it um, so they're not a big deal to change really um, it's, it's time consuming to do it correctly but they're not a big deal uh, boot floors all that sort of panels all these panels are all available uh, boot lids very rarely rust too badly they do rust a bit obviously it's still an old car but they're not too bad um, this boot lid fits well they usually do to be fair um, usually you align it here to make sure everything's lined up and if you see this gap is a tiny bit tight there compared to the other side it's not too tight so you could actually move that boot lid back a little bit if you wanted but I don't think the customer is that bothered um, the roof good roof obviously this is a mohair roof uh, vinyl roofs actually fit better mohair roofs look better but they do move a little bit like a stagger roof they do tend to grow and move a little bit and they are like a bit of a living thing uh, door locks going back to the doors usually lock themselves as you open and close the door they get a little bit of wear in the lock mechanism and eventually the lock mechanism inside will drop it sits above or something in the handle I can't remember exactly but it will lock itself so you have to be a little bit aware of that and keep the keys out um, it, it sounds like it's a bit of a triumphism, a spitfireism, um, and it sounds like you know British cars. But my Audi used to do it, and that was two thousand and seven. So uh, you know, it's not all that. Um, it, it can be a pain, and there is a fix. I did develop a fix many years ago for it, but in all honesty, the time and effort it takes, it just isn't worth it. Every sort of twelfth shut, it'll lock the door, and that's it. But it's not a big deal. <clears throat> Areas of rot to, to keep an eye on that are difficult to fix. Things like the windscreen pillar. This has got some minor surface blistering there. That isn't rotten through, I can tell that. This may be here. This is a difficult area to repair. It's caused by the drip strips, which are spot, uh, sorry, pot riveted on here. And then they have a little weld at the bottom and the moisture can get between. Um, it's important if you replace those to seal that gap as best you can. Uh, with something like a tiger seal um, and that will stop that happening again and then seal your windscreen if you fit your windscreen in uh, chrome trims on the windscreen best not talked about you don't even want to imagine trying to fit one of them get a professional windscreen fitter to do it of course after about five days you'll be crying into your into your porridge okie dokie uh, another rust area bulkhead tops um, you can see on this car this is a late car so it has the dual line master cylinder there's only the very very last of these that had them that's a, a massive massive step forward on the brakes this area here rots quite profusely as you can see it's, this has been painted with anti-stone chip or something good idea really because when you top these up or a little bit of brake fluid comes out it cleans all the paint off and then it goes red rusty on there and it rots it away this panel is available separately but it is quite a big job to unpick all this and put it in um, but you can get it and it fits really nicely similarly the um Excuse the rimmers catalog uh similarly the battery tray is rot for the exact same reason a little bit of acid comes out of the battery when it's charging sorry phone just rang so i had to stop off a sec sorry about that um yeah battery tray same as on all cars really if the battery weeps a little tiny bit of acid which kind of inevitably happens over time um it can rust out the bottom of the battery tray but again these are available this it's, you can see here it's spot welded in and actually, it's, if you're in a restoration, it's not a massive job to do at all. Um, if, you know, as jobs are concerned. Chassis, um, pretty much the same as every other Spitfire. Yes, they do suffer with little bits of rot. Um, these outriggers can go generally through damage, through hitting things and the, obviously the paint being chipped off. Um, and there's a, a kick up under the rear differential. I'm not going to show you it because it's obviously on the floor. But there's a kick up at the rear at the side of the diff where the drive shafts come through. And that tends to, I assume, moisture collects inside that and it can rot it out. Um, but they don't go too bad. The other area that can get it a little bit is the front here. Okay, the bonnet boxes can rust away. Um, and these outriggers here. Again, all these sections are available um, separately. So you can buy those outriggers, uh, which are a, quite a com complicated uh, made piece. You could make them yourself, but it, it's a little unnecessary for what the cost. Uh, and the front beam is all available. And the bonnet boxes are all available um 
quite a big job to fit the bonnet boxes. If you're restoring the car and the, the tub is off, then obviously that's a good time to look at it. And if they need doing, do them then. It's not a massive job, but you do need to make sure they are exactly in the right place. Uh, I have methods for that. Um, same with the outriggers. You can buy the outriggers as well, but you need to make sure they go back because the body locates to those um, and they need to be correct for everything to line back up. But overall, if, so if I take this car as an example, um, rust and rot wise, it has some tiny little bits of rust on it. But to be honest, for a car that I do know gets quite a lot of use, it's very minimal. It's not a rock box in any way, shape, or form. Um, and most of them are. Obviously, floors are available. Floor panels. Um, if you're doing the sills, that's when to do the floors, obviously. And those um, cross members and all that sort of stuff, that's all available. The transmission tunnel in there, they don't rust. They're actually made out of like a hardboard, cardboard affair. And you can put a fiberglass replacement in. Um, it, it's not a job I'd wish on me, worst enemy, but... It is, you know, it's not as big a deal as that, as it all sounds. So, coming back around this side and looking at the convertible roof, I can hear you all screaming down the phone at me. So, well, you've done a GT6 guide. Why would anybody want one of these over a GT6? You know, it's only a little 1.5 engine, 1500, or a 1300 if you've gotten that far. Um, but basically, it's the same car, but with a cloth, cloth roof. Well, what I tend to find is taller people have these. There are a couple of downsides with the GT6. I adore GT6s, so this isn't certainly derogatory towards GT6s. Um, but they do get hot inside. The engine heat and the, the transmission heat builds up inside and they get warm. Now, with a soft top, of course, you can take that down. Now, this soft top isn't like a stag. It's like a TR6 one. So to put it down is a five-minute job. Not going to do it. To put it back up again, five-minute job, dead easy. So if it starts to spit with rain, boom, back up. I'm talking, of course, for us in the UK. If you're in the States or Australia, then obviously you'll need the roof up to stop your sunburning probably. Um, more, than, uh, more than rain, I would imagine. But it is quite an easy, easy job either way. There are two handles up at the top there. I can just direct you to those. To lock the roof, you see them above the sun visors there. And then it's a series of press studs around the edge. Um, these do come off. Uh, there are ways of making that better usually because the hood shrunk a little bit through lack of use or being dried out. As I say, vinyl ones tend to do it less. But what I do is I put the roof halfway up and before I latch it here, I make sure all these press studs are in and then that tensions it all and it stretches it back out. So that isn't a bad thing. Um, it is if you need to replace them. But again, there are kits available to do it and it's not a big deal. Um, things to look at on the roofs. Obviously, you don't want splits and rips. Um, these aren't ludicrously expensive like a stag roof. Uh, also, have a check that the windows uh, are still clear. If they have gone yellowed, you can clean them with um, cutting compound like you can with headlamps when they go yellow too. Uh, if your windows are all absolutely glazed over, that's worth a try because there's no other way of saving them. So you may as well give it a go. Uh, I've done that for a car. I did it on a TR6. Uh, the owner sent me a second-hand roof to fit. Um, and all I did was give them a good cutting compound inside now. And, and actually, it brought them up really, really well. Not like brand new, but pretty close. So bringing you on to the inside of a Spitfire. And as I was actually, as I was, excuse me, broke off earlier. Um, usually, a lot of the customers are taller people. Um, and I did sort of... I did a weekly update when this car came in and, and I did sort of half mention it and then forgot. It's always quite funny seeing somebody sort of six foot six plus um, getting out of a little tiny sports car like this. And I do know a chap who can sit in his Spitfire and put his hand flat on the floor outside. Um, but of course, you've got headroom in a Spitfire. You can put the roof down and you can get your head out of there. And the door apertures allow people with longer legs to get in and out. Um, this one obviously has an aftermarket steering wheel. The steering wheels are standard are quite large. The later ones like these weren't. I do have a later steering wheel over here I can show you. And the picture of my Capri, that is a standard steering wheel, a similar sort of size. Um, and they do help. The earlier cars obviously had much larger steering wheels and they were a little bit awkward to get in if you were, uh, you know, not super skinny or super tall. They're just awkward. And your legs were getting, you know, I'm, I'm only five foot eight and I used to get my legs intertwined with the steering wheel. And uh, so I don't consider myself tall at all. Uh, dashboard wise, uh, obviously a wood veneer dashboard. 
Uh, good quality usually, nice. It's always aesthetically pleasing and sort of circa the time. Good Smith's gauges. I, I hear people moaning about Smith's gauges. I remember Clarkson moaning about them in a video. I've always found them really good. They're always really reliable, really accurate. Sometimes they go wrong, but, you know, nothing's perfect. Um, the tacks always work. The speedos always work pretty accurately. Temperature and fuel, different layout to a GT6. Um, but a nice, nice, simple layout. The only thing that's difficult is if you need to take the control knobs off the uh, heater to take that sense section out, you need a very tiny little Imperial Allen key. Uh, as there's a grub screw in the side here on the inside, here. Okay, and they can be a bit of a pain and it can be a long and laborious process, especially if somebody's tried to over tighten them and stripped them out. Um, and then it just becomes a, a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> But other than that, all very simple in here, all works nicely. Um, heater works nicely, fans work nicely, big big fans, uh, good demisters, and uh, a sort of Lucas-based uh, windscreen wiper system like a Mini. So the rack and pinion-based steering system, but a two-speed motor, as you can see here. So you can see the rack, rack and pinion going up there. Uh, with a good pack and everything. So easy to replace, but works very efficiently. And Spitfire's had an electric washer pump. I'm just in the process of changing that one. So it looks a bit weird there, but it's clipped down on the bulkhead. Um, and yeah, that works really well. So moving on from the wipers, uh, electrics, very good. Uh, Switch is very good. Obviously they work and work. Most of them are about 40, 50 years old. So you've got to bear that in mind. The only thing that uh, Triumph and obviously British manufacturers got wrong were these bullet connectors here. Um, these can be a bit of a living nightmare for intermittent joints. Now, these will be fungus up in there. You can see it, look. If I don't touch them or disconnect them, they'll be absolutely fine. They're all clipped up in there. And they will work absolutely fine. It's when you sort of disconnect them because you need to take a headlamp out or when I disconnect those to take the bonnet off, um, so what I do at that point is go through them. You can buy the bullets and you can buy the connectors. Remove the bullet, either sweat it off or just snip it off and shorten the wire. It's literally only half an inch, 12 mil. Um, clean the wiring if it's, if it's got any fungus on it. So, you know, clean it with a bit of wire wool or a little bit of wet and dry, something like that. Solder on new bullets. Make sure they're a good, solid solder. It's not easy and it's time consuming, but it makes a really nice job and put new connectors in. If the, connect, if the bullets are good, give them a clean with a little bit of emery cloth, a little bit of uh, wet and dry, something like that. You don't want to sort of smoosh them down to, to a size where they won't fit. Um, you may need to crimp the uh, connectors, the black part there, the rubber covered part. And when I push them in, I tend to use um, push them in from one side and then push the other side. You'll, you'll notice the metal bit inside sleeves across. So just use a screwdriver to push it back in the other way, being careful not to cut your finger ends off. Um, and then you end up with good connections. I tend to do that as I'm, when I strip a car, and then when I put the first thing you put back generally is most of the loom. And as I'm going through it, I'm re-harnessing it and I'm repairing any broken wires. And, and I tend to put new, new bullets on everything. When they're new again, they'll be fine for years and years and years and years. Okay, remember, you're not using this all year round. You're not using it in the winter. So they have been used like that. And once you replace them, they'll be good again. Um, so that's the only sort of downside of the electrics. Headlamps, uh, seal beam, seven inch, same as a mini. Uh, put allergens in. Uh, that's my recommendation, especially if you're my age and your eyes probably weren't as sharp as they were when you were 20. But that does make a massive difference. Um, a halogen upgrade is a, is a really good thing. I did a video on a TR6 doing that. It's one out, one in. Uh, the only downside is you do have to unbolt on a Spitfire this aluminium section here, which has some quarter UNF set screws in here and they can be a bit of pain to get out sometimes but once you've done it you've done it seen and forgotten and they, those take the later type bulbs which I, I appreciate are modern now I fitted LED conversions to them not overly keen I think they're very bright but for driving I don't find that they're a, a real advantage uh, so after the electrics um, let's go to the mechanics um, now, the mechanics of the chassis, the suspension and things like that, very similar to the GT6. So if you haven't seen that video, good double wishbone front suspension, very lightweight, thin materials. Okay, ball joints that bolt in, easy to replace and cheap with a trunnion at the bottom. Now, people seem to get a bit upset about trunnions. 
they're fine. They're easy to change, they're fine. Um, just make sure you lubricate them with a good thick gear oil, not grease, and they will be absolutely fine. Um, I, I favor Super Pro bushings because I've used a lot of poly bushings and Super Pro are most close to uh, rubber without being too hard. And they last a lot longer and they're resilient to, uh, to oils and damage and stuff. I'll draw your attention to the brake pipes on this car here. That brake pipe is wrong. And you have to be very careful with that brake pipe. Now, this one obviously isn't doing it, and that's fine. Uh, he hasn't asked me to change it, and that's absolutely fine. But if you don't get them right, you will tend to find they'll rub on this section of the inner wheel arch here, uh, and it'll rub through your brake pipes. They are supposed to come up and across and down and round and all sorts of things. I could do them for you, but, you know, while I'm on the camera, I'm not, not doing that. It's hard to gesticulate the shape. Uh, but, yeah, suspension very good. Coil over fronts. Um, not a big fan of adjustables. If you want to put them on, that's, that's your prerogative, but you tend to adjust them once and then they rust up and that's it, done. And you've spent an awful lot of money on them. Um, if you're that finickety about your ride, that's your choice, one iota, you know, um, do as you please. But they're very good. Brakes are very good as standard. You can get upgrades. Um, I think they're P14 or P16 calipers, um, 14s, I think. And this one's had braided hoses fitted, which I do recommend. Um, but where braided hoses are concerned, people do claim massive improvements in pedal feel. I personally don't really feel any difference, but if your rubber ones are about dead, then probably better to upgrade to these. I get these custom made with stainless steel ends and they're, they're a very good improvement. Steering racks are the standard fare uh, for Triumph, Lotus, all that sort of stuff in the middle there. Uh, and they work and they're adjustable. So if there's any play in the ends in the track rod, in uh, ball joint on the inner end, you can adjust that out and preset them, but you need to do it correctly if you're rebuilding it. Track rod ends, just same as everything else, and they're not expensive. Anti roll bars don't give any trouble and work really well. Uh, rear end, um, same transverse leaf spring. You don't want to change one of those. If you have to, you have to, but I wouldn't. Uh, if you do put a new one on, I recommend at least a half inch lowering block before you start because you'll only end up having to take it out again and put a half inch lowering block because they tend to be too strong when they're new and you get a load of positive camber, which not only looks ridiculous, but I imagine the drive would be a bit funky. Um, brakes, again, drum brakes on the rear, absolutely brilliant. Triumph brakes are always brilliant. Um, and even for an old car, they're very good. Significantly better than something like a Capri. Uh, the only f uh, weakness on the rear is the diffs are showing their age a little bit and they're not as strong as they used to be. Um, so your diff may well be worn out. It's not a huge job to change, but obviously it's not a cheap job to do either. Um, but if you've got to do it, you've got to do it. Um, the output flanges and things tend to leak uh, when they're getting a bit worn, so you can get those separately and change those. The um, drive shafts in these don't have rotor flexors or anything. They're just um, hard spicer joints, so they're not a big deal to, to deal with. Um, and, yeah, the, the, it's just sort of... It does what it says on the tin, really. It works very well, truth be told, on these later cars. Uh, transmission. This car has a four-speed. Most have an overdrive. And overdrive gearboxes now are very, very expensive if you can find one. Um, the four-speed is great, but the overdrive does, because they are quite low-ratio rear diffs, the overdrive does help it relax at sort of motorway speeds. I know this owner doesn't use his on the motorway because he's not confident revving the engine that hard when he's driving down the motorway, which I get completely. Um, well, let's be fair, and this is, you know, this is the truth. Who buys a classic sports car to drive down the motorway? Really, honestly. Um, you know, you, you, it's a country road car. <laughs> You're not really wanting to go down the motorway. So uh, would, is it worth the extra expense of an overdrive box? Well, that depends how much you want to spend it. It's, it's your money. You spend it how you want. Personally, I probably wouldn't bother. Uh, it's not like you're off to work in it every day. 50 miles you know it's not like you're going down the motorway commuting to london every weekend you know what I mean? it's just tosses for courses uh engine wise 1.3 or 1.5 1.3 in the mark 4 1.5 or 1500 in the 1500 obviously uh little overhead valve engine uh brilliant little engine they do go great they usually do a bottom end rebuild around 70,000 miles uh, I don't know why, but that tends to be the, the sort of kicking off period around there. Within about 10,000 miles of that point, it'll start to wrap a little bit. 
Um, it's not a weakness. It's not anything really. It's probably just because when it was new, people didn't change the oil regularly enough and it's worn everything out. But it's very easy to rebuild. Uh, it's not ludicrously expensive. Nothing's cheap anymore. But, it, you know, as engines go, it's not particularly expensive. Uh, they run nice and cool. You can get bigger rads and stuff. But generally, if somebody's fitted a bigger rad, they try to avoid some other issue. They don't blow head gaskets. Uh, they have SU carbs, which are fantastic little carburetors and my favourite carb in the whole wide world. There's only two moving parts in there. Uh, and unless they're absolutely worn out, you check that by lift in the butterfly, which there is not, uh, you'll be absolutely fine with those. Um, they are brill. And they just keep going and going and going. Uh, easy to set up. Make sure there's oil and dash pots. Um, I did a video on balancing these, and you can, you know, you can do that yourself. Ignition, little Lucas distributor. Uh, this one will have had electronic ignition put in. I can see that here. There are various electronic ignitions available. You can get things like AccuSparks, which I'm not a big fan of, um, but sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Uh, and that's the downside for me as a business because I don't want to fit something that's going to fail. This is something like that, an AccuSpark or a PowerSpark. I will say if you fit one of those, please check your ignition timing afterwards because it swings it quite heavily. Um, standard sort of Lucas rotor arm. The points are fine, but they're just getting difficult to find now. Um, but they do work fine, and they're absolutely fine. Unless you're doing 20,000 miles a year, they always work fine. Um, so, yeah, there's nothing really major there to worry about. Standard Lucas alternators. This one isn't charging very well, but, of course, the belt's a little bit loose, and that's probably all it is. Uh, I'll tension that first and then recheck it. That's probably all it is. Uh, if you do fit in an electronic ignition, I recommend Luminition. Uh, they're quite simple. They work effectively. They're not cheap, but you only do it once, um, in my experience. You can get it wrong, but it's, it's pretty difficult. Um, so, yeah, if you're going to put an aftermarket one in, put, put something in good quality. I've used one, two, three distributors. People seem to like those and favor those, and they are. You know, everybody seems to think they're the, the bomb diggity at the minute. Um, I, I always convince the advanced curve is correct. And although they're adjustable, it doesn't really give you any idea of which advanced curve is which. So you, it seems like you're sort of stabbing in the dark a little bit to me. And it's again, it's kind of unnecessary. You only need one. But because they're made to fit a range of different cars that will take that distributor, like a Ford Crosslow, for example, they tend to be a little bit variable. And I, I, I'm a big fan of that, really, if I'm honest. Um if, unless your distributor's worn out, and I've never seen one worn out, that's that's God's honest, then just put an electronic kit in and that'll fix all your ills. So, quick caveat at the end here, uh, quick, quick sort of add-on. Um, modifications on Spitfires. Uh, again, a bit like the minis, you'll tend to find most Spitfires have had some mods done in some time. The standard wheels are a very narrow pressed steel affair with a plastic trim in the middle. Matter of Force 1500s all had those. Uh, none of them came with alloy wheels as standard. Alloy wheels are a little bit like, I don't know really, it's just everybody's own choice. This one's got mini lights on and I really, really like them. I think they suit that car. I think they suit the colour and everything. On some cars they do, on some cars they don't. You have to be very careful to get the right wheel. Uh, the offsets on the front matter. They will catch the wing if you're running a little bit lower or anything, uh, and there'll be a complete pain unless you want to go to low-profile tyres, which will then affect your ride and your handling. Um, but wheels, you know, there are there are four by ninety-eight stud patterns, same as a mini. So there's just a bazillion amount of wheels out there, but they, it is quite expensive if you get it wrong. Um, but it's your choice at the end of the day. There's no correct wheel and tyre combination. It's just up to you entirely. Um, there are various different diffs, so do be careful if you buy a different differential, by the way. Herald and uh, early Triumph Spitfire diffs look the same, but the outdrives are different and they are interchangeable. Uh, and there are several different ratios. So again, um, it's, it pays to be careful and check what you have. Um, I don't know how they specify the different ratios. All I know is I assume it goes with overdrive boxes. Obviously, automatics weren't an option with these. You couldn't get an auto box, to the best of my knowledge. Um, I will quickly draw your attention to these pop rivets here, these press studs. These are for a tonneau cover. Uh, great idea if you're going to leave it with the roof down. Um, this car is in for me to fit Freelander wheel studs, which is an upgrade to put um, metric, thicker metric uh, wheel studs in. 
The wheel studs are 3 8 uh, UNF, which is a very, very thin stud. It's a bit like a mini, and it's very, very easy to break those studs off when you're tightening them. Under normal use and careful tightening and untightening, uh, releasing, they will absolutely be fine. Um, if you were dropping a V8 in there or something, you wouldn't have to worry about your wheel studs because you're going to break the diff before them. So, <laughs> joking aside, they are usually fine. Um, but if you want to go up to a Freelander stud, they do fit very well. Uh, this one's got different DAR mirrors on. It's got bullet mirrors on. I think they look great. But again, it's horses for courses and what you choose. Um, exhausts. There are various exhaust systems available. Uh, this one has a single standard outlet exhaust over on the driver's side. You'll see stainless systems, twin systems, all sorts of systems. Um, some fit really well. Some look cool. Some make more noise than you can ever imagine. Depends how much you want to draw people's attention to you. Yeah, so modifications are kind of down to your own choice. Um, there isn't really many that I'd recommend that are necessary. The, the, the braided hoses... Uh, are a good idea. The um, good quality brake pads, uh, alloy wheels and tyres, totally your choice. I like the Steelys as well. It doesn't make any difference in my book. Um, k and filters and things like that, they won't make any extra power. Don't waste your time. They look kind of cool, but generally they catch on the bonnet here. So pretty unnecessary, really. Um, stainless exhaust. <sighs> They do have a nasty habit of drawing attention to you. So if you're doing 30 mile an hour in a third zone going, Wah! then it doesn't always draw your positive attention. That said, some of them sound great. Some of them sound like somebody trumping into a bean can. Um, <laughs> but again, it's your choice to an exhaust. You know, the people call it a wheelbarrow when it breaks down. But, you know, um, all I would say about stainless exhaust and things is get a good quality one that people say fits well. It's quite tight where it comes out the exhaust here. You can see it there at the side of the engine. There where the downpipes come down. It gets quite tight down there, down the side of the chassis where it fits up into the chassis. If it's a poor fit, it's going to either rattle on the chassis or you're going to have to have it altered. Um, having altered cheaply uh, sourced exhausts that people have sourced themselves and go, oh, I got this off eBay. It was really cheap. And yeah, there's a reason it's really cheap. Now it's costing an extra 500 quid for me to cut it up over the last three or four days, you know. Um, cause it's got a fit. It can't just sit and rattle and break all the mountains and stuff. So that's always a good thing to look at. Um, things like smaller steering wheels, that's personal taste. Again, um, you know, it, it, there's no point me saying this is what you need. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty much horses for courses really where modifications are concerned in my, for what it's worth, humble opinion. Things like oil coolers and that, not really necessary. Bigger aluminium radiators, not really necessary. Alley rocker covers, not really necessary. They'll quieten the tappet noise a bit. But to be honest, if you adjust your tappets and they're still making a noise, they're worn out. So, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, there is things you can buy. There's things you can use to personalise your car, but none of them are really anything I'd consider necessary. Uh, lowering them a little bit can make them look nice, but of course then you run into things like clashing with your, with your bonnet, with your wheels. So again, not necessary really when you look at a gt6 the two liter engine is a bit more highly stressed and trapped in this body um and therefore it gets hotter and you need a little extra cooling and things like that uh, and the interior can get hot and therefore it's better to have a sunroof and things like that but on a spitfire there's really not much um they do handle well if you put a vitesse or a gt6 engine in they go like a stabbed rat they really do go really well um there are various brake upgrades if you're going higher powered uh, I do know somebody, a customer of mine, who has a Dolomite Sprint engine in his, which is not an easy job to fit. Um, I have a friend with a Z-Tech engine in one. Whether he's ever finished it or not, I don't know. Um, people put all sorts of engines in. I've always fancied a bigger engine, but the diff is an issue. If you're going to go for a bigger engine and you want to upgrade the diff, uh, I know the chap with the Sprint engine has a Subaru diff on the back, um, and it's a quite a simple kit that fits that in, actually. Um, now... I used to have an Impreza. Um, when it wasn't broken, it went really well, and the diff never grumbled at all. But that said, I didn't own it for years and years and years. So how strong they actually are, I have no idea. But it is a long, thin differential, and it fits in the in the aperture quite nicely. But of course, then you'll need a different prop shaft. You'll need potentially drive shaft adapters and things like that. So you know, it's 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 a bit of an exponential spending curve. But on the overall, great car. So yeah, uh, Spitfires. Mark 4s, 
1300s, uh, 1500s, 1500s, brilliant car. Um, fit everybody, short, tall, thin, fat, you, you can get in one, middle-aged, young, old, whichever, you can always fit in a Spitfire. They're affordable to buy, they're affordable to restore, and they're affordable to maintain, which is a big thing, I think. Um, absolutely usable, and the fact is, because they're a little bit cheaper to buy, you're not scared of using it. You haven't got £50,000 in it, and therefore you dare take it to a show, you dare take it out on the weekend, you dare use it when it blooming rains. Uh, this owner never uses his car in the rain, ever, and it rained when he dropped it off and he was gutted. Um, that's his prerogative at the end of the day, but if you're buying a car that's a little bit cheaper, at least you're not worrying about it ever getting a speck of rust or a bit of mark on it. Just my humble opinion. But yeah, overall, really good buy, great driving car, um, so low to, low to the floor. It feels like you're doing 150 mile an hour when you're doing 40, so yeah, can't, uh, can't recommend one enough. Just go out and buy one, stop faffing about and get one.